All right, shalom, shalom, chabarim, shalom. Hopefully this will be a brief intro video, like a shot across the bow sort of video. And um, yeah, let's get into this and get out this right here. Just to, just to lay the, the, the context, the, the subject, the, the scope, the scope of this particular video, right? And ancient Kemet, what's called ancient Kemet. Now this is in light of the... Um, the Egyptian, the ancient Kemet, ancient Egyptian origins. Um, there was a conference that was supposed to be had over in modern Egypt to discuss mainly among black American, they would call themselves African American, like scholars, you know, um, pro-black um, Kemetic scholars that have very good scholarship, a very good, a lot of good points of the scholarship. You know, that even we embrace, though, though we might differ and we do disagree on some fundamental points. And one of them is the point that we're going to address or seek to address in this brief video. We was listening and hearing a few ones um, discuss a few things. Um, I think it was Jabari and also we heard um, Asar Imhotep, you know, um, speak. And when they had spoke, this point once again came to mind and we articulated to a few ones who were around us and then we recall what well, we had spoke about this a couple of weeks ago almost almost a month ago when the the news first came out we it was reported that they had shut it down that the modern um, egyptians we could say arabs some refer to them as arabic speaking peoples who dwell in the territory that's called today egypt that has been renamed to be egypt today nowadays and um, that they had shut down the conference with certain ones like Leonard Jeffries. I think Leonard Jeffries was one of them. We recall him from back in Brooklyn College, BC. We call that the BC, our BC days, Brooklyn College, back in like the 90s when there was a lot of this similar and same um, battlefronts that were opened up. You know, at that particular time, it was some of the European. Um, um, the white Jews up in the New York area regarding some of the universities, like I think at Cornell, I think Cornell Universities and with Dr. Leonard Jeffries and his tenure and his teaching. And we had a lot of events down at Brooklyn College at that particular time. Also had the first uh, Egyptian, uh, not Egyptian, sorry, strike that, the first Kemetic, the first Kemetic um, fraternity and sorority at the same time having the first Ethiopic black, you could say the Ethiopic frat, <laughs> um, Ethiopic letter fraternity. That's how we had styled it at that time. You know, um, Yehuda Moa Anbessa, you know, aka the Lion of Judah, the academic club that was founded at Brooklyn College around that same time. That was like the seed and the roots of the society known as the LOJ, the Lion of Judah Society. Check us out at LOJS.org. So, Moving forward, nearly 20, uh, let's see, no, actually 40, what, what would that be? That would be almost 40, 40 years. Wow. Well, no, not, that's not, not 40 years. No, 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 no. Let's get the math right. That's about like 30, 30, 32 years. About 32 years later, bringing it roughly to this very time, about maybe 31, 30. I was rounded off to 30 years later to find that some of the same generation, I think Leonard Jeffries, his name had come up, as well as others who were all invited, you know, um, to the particular Dr. Smalls, also Professor, you know, um, Smalls have to hail up, you know, those great ones and love Professor Smalls because he always inserts the Ethiopia aspect. And if we have crafted the title of this video the way we have um, thought of it, Right for this purpose here, and this put this on the record that ancient Egypt, aka the KMT, you know, Kemet, ancient Egypt has more to do with or is from actually from ancient Ethiopia. So, ancient we say ancient Egypt, let's say, let's say it like this ancient Egypt, right, is from ancient Ethiopia, not the Africa pseudonym. Not the Africa pseudonym. I want ones to hear me clearly because I know this is a this is a controversial point right here, and it's a point that many ones will sidestep, and many of our um, chief scholars will sidestep, and they will fall into the pseudonym, and they will seek to argue this particular point from the pseudonym. Now, as we said, that the 
Arabs or the Egyptian Arabs, uh, others refer to them as the pale red Arabs, which is interesting because that then brings to light the racism, right? The indigenous racism in that particular region to darker skinned um, peoples or peoples who are identified today as African peoples. So the modern Arab Egyptians are stating in their scholarship, like the Dr. Hawass, um, Zawi, Zawa, Haas, Haas, you know, that, that Zawa Haas guy, right? He is basically saying, right? He's basically, him and his people are basically saying that ancient Egypt has nothing to do, its origins have nothing to do with what is called Africa. We say, that that is a lie that is wrong, but we understand why that why they always revert to a particular argument, and we're saying to the pro, the pro um, black and to the the comedic scholarship, Africa is a pseudonym. It's a 400 year pseudonym, and when we look at the evidence, we look at the evidence. If we just look at the the historical evidence, and doesn't mean just the European. The Europeans may be the holders and the collectors and the gatherers and the appropriators and misappropriators of this evidence in their libraries and schools and institutions, and this is where we find many of these, or at least copies or some of the originals of these ancient these ancient art and facts. You know what I mean? we have to get around this pseudonym and address the pseudonym because when we actually go into the research, the ancient research, we find that the ancient Ethiopia, like the Tob Tobia, Ethiopia, Ethiopia, Tobia, as we get into our own indigenous linguistics, because some would say that when we say Ethiopia, that's Greek, right? And this shows the limitation of their scholarship. Their scholarship is in the European, you know, we say the white mind. And they are half original. In other words, they are pro-black, they are pro-so-called African, you know, they're, they're, they're pro-our people, right, in their, you could say, in their dialogue, in their teaching, in the, the focus of their discussions, yes. However, they lack the linguistic, right, the linguistic focus. And what many of these ones, even the so-called pale red Arabs, the modern-day Egyptian, Ar Arabian, I don't want to call them Arabian. We know their history and their background, but just for the record, so-called Middle Eastern Arab people, especially of ancient, of modern Egypt, are saying, and they're going into a lot of their perspective of scholarship using linguistics, using what basically is, by and large, from its roots, one of our languages. And I'm speaking about like even the Arabic language, even they're using Arabic. We've been looking over a lot of different, you know, ancient Egyptian um, interpretations of different words, names, phrases, uh, scripts, scrolls from ancient Egypt. And they're applying the discipline of the, you know, Arabic language to try to discern. Right? And by making certain um, links and roots, you know, certain connections, making certain general connections with certain words, are therefore speaking to their own, you could say, audience, which are descendants of those who have invaded, right, ancient Egypt, invaded Kemet, right, and dis, uh, dis, di dispersed or dislocated much of the ancient population. Right, that have not just genetic links with the ancient Kemetic or the ancient Egyptian people, right, but also have linguistic links and also have that knowledge, a lot of the knowledge, right, of who's who and what's what, right, that inner knowledge that real scholarship need. Now, these people are like the people in the Aswan, the people in more of the southern part of uh, modern Egypt. But as we said, we don't want to get too much into that right there, but just try to go over and state some of the main points, right? And why we, um, why we say that until our own pro-black, pro-Egyptian, pro-Kemetic scholarship really gets this point, right? And takes the evidence that we have, right? The evidence and the evidence that is available. Right. And also some of the other scholars and scholarship. Actually, I was going through this video. I was looking for Legacy Alens, his particular work on the Amarinya and the Tigrinya, looking at the Ethiopic um, linguistics and languages and culture right, to identify and to point to those connections that help us to discern and decipher 
what is called ancient Egyptian, you know, culture, ancient Egyptian artifacts, the ancient Egyptian and the ancient Egyptian cometic studies. And so that's why I was going to point to Legacy Allen's, Legacy Allen's particular work. I, I showed it in an earlier video, hopefully on Rastafari, Yehud, Rastafari Jews, hopefully on Rastafari Jews, the YouTube channel, you might be able to find that particular video where we just briefly point to some of the available books and we were saying even in that video that many of our scholars and scholarship you know the black scholarship and some ones and ones I don't want to get into some of the names because it's not about the personalities or the individuals so much what is really more um, more important right is us being able to articulate and understand right that part of the one of the main reasons why it seems as though in spite of generation after generation of pro-black, pro-comedic scholarship, you know, kind of growing and even more information coming out, it becomes more clear, especially to our audience. When we show a lot of the art and facts and the art and facts are showed by other ones and ones, you know, we see, you know, the you know, wall paintings, we see, uh, we see the monuments, you know, the monumental evidence, the wall painting evidence. It's obvious to us black peoples, like in the Americas and the Caribbean, it's obvious to us, you know, we see this, that yes, these are black peoples. <laughs> you know, we, we can identify them, you know, with ourselves over here in the Americas and the Caribbean. We can identify them with those on the continent, especially, you know, from, from, from East and from West you know, from the south, and even, you know, sprinkled, as it were, up in the north, when we look at the continent today. We look at the, 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 the demographics, you know, the people groups on the continent today, right, which by and large do not exactly reflect, right, the dispersion of peoples and populations, by and large, thousands of years ago. But with the region known as East of the River Now. We identify this and we coin this East of the River Now, right? Or East of the, the Ethiopian River, right? We find that in those regions like the Horn of Africa, right? We have almost all the population groups, right? That we can find on the wall paintings and monuments, the, the majority, right? I'll say the great majority, right? Definitely more than like 85 to almost 90% of those ancient populations, many of them still speaking by right, the linguistics and the language and still practicing culture, certain, certain, you could say ancestral and foundational cultural precepts and principles, right? Albeit maybe somewhat differently because of, you know, influences that have come in from maybe elsewhere or different growths and things. Like we look at ourselves as black people over here in America and then we look at our people like say say 100, 200 years ago, right? Of course we can make that connection with modern black uh, people in the Americas and the Caribbean who have 400 year roots over here in this Western Gentile, in this, in this hemisphere, we can make those connections with our people like, you know, hundreds, a couple of hundred years ago. You know, we can go back to 1865 and then go back to 1765 and go back to even, uh, you know, 16, <laughs> you know, 65. And, but we, what we see is different is that, you know, there were changes in society and laws and also with the, the whole civil war, you know, and therefore with these changes, certain things change, but there's some fundamental, it's like fingerprints, you know how they can identify people by fingerprints, there's some fingerprint evidence that exists right there. So when we say that ancient, the, 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 the part of the argument that has not been put forward that we're suggesting and recommending to the pro-black scholarship and the pro comedic you know, scholarship that needs to be put forward is that ancient Egypt, instead of falling into the trap, you see, the trap is the pseudonym. The pseudonym is the Africa pseudonym. And with some people, when we say this, they say, oh, you hate Africa. You, know, you, you, you try to say you're not African, you're not black, da, 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 da. You, hate, you hate yourself. No, 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 stop that, that. That's childish. That's parochial. That's a parochial argument right there. It's a real parochial argument. Uh, or some may even call it like kind of a straw man argument. It's like, it's like not paying attention to what we and many others have been saying. 
And then we find that there were ones like, say, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and even before that, before even we became conscious of this, that were making these very same arguments. And these arguments were so devastating my, to the Western Gentile white supremacist, white racism, and a lot of the modern day, you could say, Arab um, speaking Egyptians, they are part and parcel. Right? They are complicit. They are like accomplices, although they might be a little darker, <laughs> slightly, you know, than the so-called European or, or have, have a little tan, a natural tan, like some of the modern Egyptian Arabic speaking people and people in that particular region that are defending the, the Arab origin. They're saying that ancient Egypt, what the modern Arabs and Egyptian Arabs are seeking to say is that ancient Egypt is part of their heritage and it has nothing to do with what is called Africa, right? And what we say is Ethiopia in Africa. But many of the scholars that are going up and have gone up and seek to go up against this uh, faulty paradigm, this white racist, basically it's a white racist, white racism paradigm that many of the Egyptian Arabs are putting forward, but they're putting it forward not in white face <laughs> or in you know, so-called overtly white racist, white supremacist terms, but now it's being put forward so to the white people and the white scholarship. It's like, look at this. It's these, th these two um, third world people. Look at these third world people <laughs> arguing over ancient Egypt because there's still many white scholars and scholarship, white race and white supremacy that still is believing, right? Still believes that ancient Egypt, that, that is their origin and they are the originators of ancient Egypt. So what the black scholarship and the pro-black scholarship is up against, by and large, has been, you know, the white racism and white supremacy scholarship, the whitewashing of ancient Egypt scholarship, on one hand. And now, it seems even more so, on the tip of the spear, is the so-called white Arabs. I gotta say white Arabs, just to make this clear, because, you know, the white Arabs or the modern Arab-speaking Egyptian especially their scholarship, and they had shut down this particular convention using some, uh, we heard some rumors concerning some, some bots or technology that the Russians, you know, you know, you remember back with Trump, they was talking about how Trump and the Russians had stole the election or done something with some software, whatnot like that. Well, it seems as though this same sort of thing is what has been done recently to shut down a, a pro, you could say, comedic, pro-black, comedic um, origins conference and discussion that was supposed to be had in modern Egypt, you know, at the scene of the crime, so to speak, that it was shut down, right? And many of the black scholars and the pro-Egyptian, you know, pro-black Egyptian scholars, you know, they're, how can you say, they're, um, <clears throat> they're reeling, they're reeling from this, you know, they're reeling from this. And once again, we're going to seek to propose and put this forward that we need to argue the point, first of all, from the Ethiopia perspective. Because when we look at the actual art and fact and the evidence, for example, it's clear that ancient Egypt, Kemet, or from an Israelite perspective, we say Mitzrayim, Mizraim, but let's keep to the terms that people know for right now. Right? But we need to move out of that. Because a lot of times we're regurgitating terminology that is accepted right, by so-called the Anglo-American, or we could say the, the, the white supremacist, white racist, academic superstructure. Right? And we're using their terminologies. Right? When I say their terminologies, I'm speaking about the Africa pseudonym. Right? The Africa pseudonym. Because it's very clear before these things have become more in their hand. At this time, when we look at this map here, this map says Ethiopia, and it says Ethiopia in the region of, we could say, um, Southern Africa. The whole stretch of Southern Africa is given the name Ethiopia. This map is um, conservatively between the 17th and 18th century. That's just like yesterday. That's like about a day or two ago. You, you know what I mean? It's fairly recent, but at that particular time, my, at that particular time, the situation was different. The situation was more clearly, even the scholarship 
a lot of the early scholarship of ancient Egypt had the white scholars admitting straight up that, wow, oh my God, all, all this black ancient culture from thousands of years ago is black. Look at the monuments, look at the wall paintings. And sometimes even coming out in their writings, Negroid, you know, Negroid, and, and linking them to, to some of the explorations of the different um, Ethiopian peoples. Now, I don't know if you've seen the map where it says um, Upper Ethiopia and Lower Ethiopia. This is how the continent was identified by, on maps that go back at least to, you know, the 16th, right? I think we've even seen a 15th century, right? 15th or 14th, but roughly around there, or even the earlier, you know, a portion of a map. But it was the, the copy that was available, it was like some collector's item. I think it was sold somewhere, right? So it still had it like when you go research pictures, but the picture that's available for you to save is not very clear, right? It was not very clear, it was somewhat blurry, but it was dating this particular map where I think it was like around maybe 1300 something, 1400 something, where it was identifying the continent, the regions, you know, as um, synonymous with the name Ethiopia or Tobia. Because we know that the Ethiopia nomenclature in the Western world, in the Western Gentile world, right, goes back to the time of the um, the the Greeks. And I, I pause to say Greeks because as we did the other video about that the original Greeks, right, were black people, right? I had to use the term Greeks even though the people themselves were not the Gracoi or the Helen, the people, the children of Hellas. Right? The people themselves, the earliest, the original Greeks were called the Yawan, Javan, Jonah. Jonah also links with their nomenclature, and they were known in ancient Egypt as the Keftiu. Just to kind of point out that when we start to say that, oh, um, like Europe, we say Europe to, to equal white people is a bad, it's another bad scholarship. And all of this affects us when the game is on, when we're seeking to argue such a point that basically ancient Egypt has black roots. Why don't we just keep it to that right there? Why can't we just say that ancient Egypt has black roots, right? Okay, that's some other scholarship right there. <laughs> know your zebras. Okay, here we go. That ancient Egypt, what is called quote, end quote, right? Ancient quote, end quote, Egypt has black roots, has inner continental roots. Even if we step away from the nomenclature for a moment, inner continental roots. And, and what shows that most powerfully is the geographical feature known as the, or called the Nile, right? Some call it the Nile River. That's when you're in the Egyptian location. But as you get to the roots, the Ethiopian, the highlands, the roots, inner Africa, what we can call inner Africa or the inner continental roots, right? You will find that the Nile flows from south to north, from inner Africa. And the very roots go all the way deeply into the southern portion of the Ethiopian continent because this is how the maps were identified. So, stop for a moment. If this map is a historical map, who gave them the right to change this name and where did they get the term Africa from? I'm not saying how we can speculate. We can speculate on Africa, those of us who have linguistic um, linguistic abilities you know I could say Afar I could say Afar you know like I could look at Afar I could look at Ferrek Ferrek Aferrek I could you know associate it with all of that but if I do it still has nothing to do with what the ancient um, inhabitants of the continent called or referred to themselves as and when the so-called white man first did his explorations right there's a little bit of honesty in some of the initial, the first time he come across anything, especially when he's writing to himself and he's doing his log or his journal, right? It's gonna come out like the straight facts, you know, at least as straight as he's able to <laughs> articulate them. But then as you go over a lot of the, their research, like when he first opened the tombs and, and he first wrote their notes and, and their first observations, Right? But then after they had conferences and discussions and they had, was able to rework the information, you know, things changed. You know, things began to change, you know, because then they began to say the first observation was like, this is black. That's why I said we should say as black roots. Right? But we can't avoid, right? we can't avoid the nomenclature. And so we could say the African, Africa pseudonym. Africa is a pseudonym. And when we say pseudonym, it's basically a false naming. 
because the African naming of the continent is directly connected with the, Bur the, the, the Belgium, the Belgium, the Belgium conference, right? Roughly circa the 18, you could say the 1800s, right? Concerning the 1800s, and, and actually the 1800s is the 19th century. Now, even the, the enslavement, the enslavement of we black peoples over here in the Americas and the Caribbean, right? The earliest dates we can point to, right, is like the 1600s, and that would be the 17th century. So we have the, the 17th century, the 18th century, and then the overall renaming and the pseudonyming, the pseudonyming of the continent formerly known as Ethiopia, and on many of the oldest maps as Upper Ethiopia and Lower Ethiopia. It sounds familiar? Sounds familiar? Upper Ethiopia and Lower Ethiopia. Does that sound familiar? For anyone who's done this, you know, going over the research, well, they say Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, Upper Egypt. And this is one reason why in the Hebrew we say Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim, or Mizraim, Mizraim from the Mitzas, the Mitzas. Right? The upper, almost like districts, the upper and the lower districts, or the upper and the lower regions, because they're sort of identifiable. And even as we get into some of the geography, there's some geographical differences, right, between here and there, right? Why many of names of places are actually named what they're named, like when we talk about the Hindus Kush. Why is it called the Hindus Kush Mountains? If Kush is all the way, if Kush is supposed to be Ethiopia, the Horn of Africa region, then why do we have Kush all the way over? Why, right? you know, in, in, in Asia, right? In Asia, <laughs> you know, because that Middle East is also like another terminology. You know how folks are so much on the Middle East and say there's no Middle East, those of us who really know the scholarship, we rename it Far East Africa. Yes, we use the term Africa. Yes, we, 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 admit we use the term Africa in this context. Why do we use the term Africa in renaming the Middle East, Far East Africa, right? Because until the victory is won, right, over the pseudonym of Africa, it is still useful. So we're not dismissing it because some would be easy, like have a knee-jerk reaction and then say, um, oh, they hate themselves. Oh, they, you know, they, they hate Africa. Oh, oh, these are Hebrews or Israelites. And let, let, let me put you straight on something. It was those who were most inclined or overtly identifiable with, the, with, with being um, Hebrews or Israelites amongst our people over here in the Americas, especially, right? And throughout the Caribbean, right? Um, about 100 years ago roughly around the turn of the 19th, 19, 1900s, right? Coming into the 20th century. And even in the 19th century, like the so-called um, 1800s, many of those who were doing the scholarly, the scholarly work, right? They were the ones who were first identifying the blackness, right? And this is before even a lot more, like the King Tut. King Tut wasn't even found at, at, the, at, the, at that time when we find some of the earliest documentable evidence of black people who over here in the Americas who some of them even just identify themselves as colored people. So when in their writing they refer to black people as colored people, this gives us a clear indication to the time, right, to the dispensation of the time, the context in which they were writing. And they were both identifying that the ancient Egyptians, right, the ancient Egyptians were black people, right, were black people. Right? were colored people, were Negroid people. In fact, they were using terms like Negroid. This is very key and important because that means that the research and the evidence they had around them, it's not like we, we read it today and we have more evidence nearly 200 years later. So we look at some of their writings and say, oh, how could they be calling us colored people? We black, see, that's the white man. We get caught up on that kind of stuff right there. And instead of having the sober-minded scholarships uh, scholars, right, to do the scholarship on it and really to weigh and balance it and, and refine, like do like an overall that is, that is not biased, you know, we're seeking not to be biased from what ones might say, oh, you represent the royal order of the Ethiopian Hebrews after the order <laughs> of Melchizedek or, or the commandment keepers congregation. That's our roots. So when one talk about, oh, Hebrews and Israelites, you know, um, are against, uh, you know, Africa or hate on Africa, that's just a little talking point. That's like kind of a little um, hype. That's like, that's like House of Consciousness, uh, Sarnetta and some other peoples out there on social media. That, that's a little hype. That's basically like, like advertisement hype right there. That's a hype. If you take it as a fact, 
and you build a big argument and you invest in it, you can get your whole, whole house to come down like the proverbial Tower of Babel. You know what I mean? Because the first scholars that we find, the early scholars, let's put that, the first and the early scholars, among the first and the early scholarship that we find among black people over here in the Americas, right? Because they were the ones who were more able to do that serious scholarship. You know, because of the position where they were on behalf of all our, our diasporic people and even our people on the continent, they were making these sort of claims that we are making, right? It was only until the Berlin, the Belgium, <laughs> the Belgium conference, right, when they carved up Africa. See, what's missed by a lot of the scholars is that when they carved up Africa, so-called, at the Berlin I keep saying Berlin, at the Belgium conference, right? When they carved up Africa at the Belgium conference, get this, right? Is also when they renamed the continent, right? And they all joined together and say, this is the name that it shall be called. You know what I'm saying? They said, this is the name, you know? It's not like a conspiracy. It is a conspiracy. It was a conspiracy, right? It was a conspiracy of the times of the Gentiles the times of the white Gentiles. And white Gentiles, in other words, and as the white nations, right? The white nations, the white nation states. And these are political terminologies that fit the time and the region. So what we just did was connect prophecy of the scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, with real history of the time, right? And those who can understand it, understand where we're at right now and the true way to achieve victory on behalf of our people. And even to do a 180, Right on the losses that occurred, the temporarily losses that occurred with that conference of our pro-black, pro-comedic scholars that was about to go out to uh, modern Egypt to defend, we could say the African or the black roots of ancient Egypt, while others are trying to say no, ancient Egypt had nothing to do with so-called Negroid, kinky, woolly-haired, right, um, medium to dark, brown, black, blue, black skinned people. Even though, when we look at the monuments, right, and we look at the actual testimony, this right here, let's, let's go right here. Okay, here we go. Like, for example, like, for example, I mean, we see this right here, right? We see this right here, right? These are just some evidences that, how can anyone in their right mind seeing these evidences right here? And even the one that's the Shemitic, or um, we say the more Israelitish, or some would say the Canaanitish one, as you can see right here. Now this, of course, is a kind of a reconstruct right here, here, here. But it's very clear that we can identify these peoples right in the Horn region of Africa, even to, you know, the, the Horn of what's called Africa today. Like, look right here. You see Ethiopia? Now look at this whole region over here that's named Ethiopia. This is the real roots. This region, let me take that off. This region right here, is one of the primary, I'll say the primary route, and it's all because of the river. It's all, follow the water. You wanna know the roots of ancient Kemet, of ancient Mitzrayim? So when I say Kemet, I'm speaking to the pro-black, the Kemetic, you know, brothers and sisters out there. When I say Mitzrayim, speaking to the Hebrew, the Israelite brothers and sisters out there, you know, and even saying, saying um, if we use the term um, Egypt, then all the others, if you want to know the roots, you got to follow the water. You got to follow the water, right? The source. What's the source of the so-called Nile River, right? And what was the significance, right, of the Nile River based on the evidence of the earliest testimonies of the ancient indigenous, you know, peoples themselves based on the art and facts we have. All the art and facts that we have and even the modern um, Egyptian Arabic speaking people who are who are trying to appropriate some say you know they're trying to basically steal you know well I would say that they have already stole I'm not gonna say that they're doing it they have already done it right and they've done it you know hand in hand right with white supremacy white racism and what is basically going on right now is a sort of a academic intellectual proxy war right what's going on right now is a proxy war. <laughs> I mean, here and there. Brothers and sisters, okay, I think we made that point more or less, um, but there's something else that we sort to just put in, okay, right here, just to look at the names. Let's go from, 
okay, which direction should we go from? Let's go over here and give thanks. I think this is this is uh, is this uh, Mr. Mr. Imhotep? Okay, this is Mr. Imhotep, right? And um, I know sometimes different scholars, right, will disagree on some things or maybe disagreeably with each other. But I think this is something where, where we have to kind of like. Um, you know, like when, you know, when the big men are coming together, they have to check their weapons at the door. Mm -hmm. I think this is one we, we really, if we sincere, got to check our weapons at the door. Right. I say this because I know of like the Asar Imhoteps. Right. That from the information I have gotten, have, 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 have wrongly gone against some really superior and important scholarship of ones like Legacy Allen, Legacy Allen, right? And there's other areas. I point that out there because um, that right there, I've, I've looked at some people's scholarship on one hand. I say, wow, this is great. And then I've gotten to maybe speak to someone else who is also a scholar in that, in that lane, in that league. And then I find that, what? You're not getting along? For what? This is, this is garbage. You know, and then when we have a defeat, such as with the conference or a turnaround, you know, a turnaround. I say, Chan, this is because, you know, yeah, you know, bless all the peacemakers and we hope to at least be a, you know, a peacemaker in regards to us discussing the Africa pseudonym, right? In what ways, yes, we, we are kind of forced on a certain level to use it, right? We're forced on a certain level to use it. Right? Because it's the present reality we find ourselves in. But then as we as scholars or as those who, who call themselves um, really researchers and doing the research and, and, and having the evidence and the receipts or whatever like that, it's very clear that the most ancient name of the continent right, was Ethiopia. And what's not so clear to some folks, but it's clear to others of us who are into the linguistics. See, the linguistics, I heard, I saw Imhotep, you know, mention something about linguistics on this, um, they were talking about the Africa Conference and Jabari was there and, um, what's his name, Sadnetta was hosting this and he mentioned something, he went on to a little, i say spiel, so to speak, a good spiel, right, on um, linguistics, you know, the role and the use of linguistics. I thought that was to be ironic because if what I've heard is true, you know, he has kind of um, gone against some of other scholars who are out there. There's some other scholars who are actually presenting the linguistics, but what they're saying is what we're saying, that the roots and the origin, right, of what's called ancient Egypt is from ancient Ethiopia and not from the Africa pseudonym. The Africa pseudonym was introduced by, you could say, the conqueror, by the invader, by white supremacy, white racism. That was introduced by them circa Berlin Conference. I, I said it again, Belgium. Sorry, brothers and sisters, you find me a little, doing a little wrestling. It's like that ancient Egyptian um, scroll about the man that contended with his own ba, his own soul, so to speak. You know, um, for some reason, I keep saying Belgium. Right, Bel I mean Ber Berlin instead of Belgium. Something about the bees. Excuse me, brothers and sisters. I'm gonna work this out. I'm working this out. You know. But yeah. So this is one map right here. This is provided by um, one name, Mr. Imhotep. Ethiopia was a classical Greek term for the Upper Nile region, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa in its entirety. Let's pause this right here because some, right. Some would say, mm, some would say Ethiopia is a Greek term. It's the Greeks. It's the Greeks. You, you've probably heard this. There's probably ones who probably already have argued this. And before they listen to the full or full of this, might still argue this. But we have been one of the first to kind of bring forward both the evidence, bring forward the point along with um, the preliminary and even some more advanced evidence and documentation to prove that the term Ethiopia actually is Afro-Semitic and not Greek. That the term Ethiopia in its origin, because when they said that Ethiopia was a, a, a classical Greek term and they say, well, the Greeks to imply like white people, right, named the Ethiopians Ethiopians and named Africa Ethiopia and had nothing to do with, well, 
where did the Greeks get this from? There is the narrative, you know, like the the cover story. The cover story is this. The cover story is basically that, uh, right? Originally, right, they were called burnt face because the Greeks, right, went there and saw them and looked at them and said, "Oh, look, these people are burnt face people." So we'll call them Athiops, Athiops, Athiops. We call them Athiops, and this is the cover story that has been put forward. But that cover story. It's just that. It's a cover story. Right? It's a cover story. You know what I mean? It's like a lot of other cover stories. I, I, I don't need to give any example, do I? At this very time, it's a cover story. But the real, the real historical, the real evidence is that when those Greeks came to the region, right, that is most identifiable even today with the Ethiopian name, they encountered, right, the people who identify themselves and their king with the terminology that we have clearly in the Hebrew of Tob. Tob. Tob, interesting enough, means good. Tob means good. And this terminology throughout the Hebrew Bible or scripture is applied with certain land. Even the promised land is called the good land. Etoba. My arsa. My etoba, etoba, my etoba. <laughs> right? The Tob, the, the good land, or, or she, she who is the good land. Right? So this also brings in the connection as ones would have like with mother or like say mama, say Africa, or more correctly, mama Ethiopia. Right? But that cover story, they say they, they say the cover up, because a cover up, right? It's a cover up that reinforces a lie. The lie is that the Greeks just made up this name and superimposed it on the people and the people just adopted the made up name. A people, mind you, who have been able to resist all colonization and domination, right, while the rest of the continent fell more or less to said colonization and to said domination. So I, I, I just need to point that out right there because no one's going to say, oh, Ethiopia is Greek, Ethiopia is Greek, it's for the Greeks, the Greeks named and so forth. Those people who are saying that today are regurgitating pseudo-scholarship. That point of view today is pseudo. Perhaps it was believed by previously, right? but that was when more scholarship right, was not applicable Right? or not applied. The science was not applied. The science has been applied, the evidence has been recovered, and even to this day we have many, you know, Ethiopians, right, and the Ethiopian scholars who also, you know, are, you could say, co-signing that. I, let me see if I can bring this up right here, brothers and sisters. Let, let me just do this quickly right here, um, just as a point of evidence. Where is the, I might not have, there we go, Abyssinia, Abyssinica Dictionary, right? Abyssinica Dictionary. Let's do this right here, brothers and sisters. Okay, let us put, um, let us put, here we're going to spell out Tobia, right? You see right there? It's on the left-hand side, Tobia, right? And then we're going to put the search. Boom. Now, uh, if I had the transliteration, right, you can see that what, what's, the characters you see there, is three characters. The first one reading from left to right is to, to. The second one is B, B, right? The third one is ya, is ya, right? So together it's to be ya. But here in the Abyssinica um, dictionary, you can clearly see when we look up to be ya in the dictionary, right? And there's scholarship that backs us up. I mean, we had our, our scholarship, right? Like I said, we think we prompted the Ethiopian scholarship to kind of come out and bring even backative, you know, more backing evidence. And we give thanks to a few of those scholars that had come out when we had some videos up on the, the old channel. Some we call like the Rastafari Sabbatical. Which was, which, which was a mega site on the YouTubes. And then also we had the Ethiopian World Net. We had the first one, right? <laughs> they took down the first one. Some, some of the babies on, the, on social media might not, the youths might not recall that, but that was, that was more close to the time of like the 2000s. 
And then we initiated the second site, Ethiopian World site, Ethiopian World Net. And then a little after that, around say the 2010s, within that range right there, we had Rastafari sabbatical where we started to focus on more of the, you know, our roots, you know, our um, Yehudi and tribe of Judah and Yehuda. Uh, Judeo, we say Christian, so to speak, Israelites of Ethiopia. We like to refer to like that, the Israelite, Israelite of Ethiopia roots. These are little um, phrases and terminologies that we and our Chabarim, our co-laborers have coined, right? Because this is to go against some of these other nomenclatures and pseudonyms, right? There's other pseudo phrases that have been accepted by academia and some of our brothers and sisters who have excelled in academia. Right, but are pro you can say pro black and pro what we are about. They, I can say, have adopted some of this terminology, scholarly terminology, that is basically traps. It's kind of like traps, like uh, these are like foot snares, foot traps, scandal, scandalions, right? And uh, that I've been tripping us up. It's like when we say that ancient Egypt, right? The roots of ancient Egypt is Africa. Now, on a, on a superficial level, it, it sounds good. But then when we take that to the scholarly level, and you're defending that on the scholarly level, it's very easy to dismiss the term Africa, right? While it's not so easy to dismiss the term Tobia. You know why? Because within the Hebrew Bible, we have the term Tob and Tobia. And we get to the root of the linguistics we also have it in connection with the land and in connection with the promised land. And based on what the Bible says to Abraham, right, the land that was to be given to his seed was from the river of Egypt, which is referred to as the river now, right, but the river of Egypt, but that's one contiguous river with the river that comes from the inner continent or the inner, what's called inner Africa by some. Right? But we re-identify that with inner Tobia, right? the good land. But now in the geopolitical terms today, see this is where the whole thing about nations and nation states and Gentiles, the times of the Gentiles, comes in. We're not going to go into this right here, but please make a note of this. Nations, the terminology nations, the political terminology nation states, and the biblical prophetic terminology um, times of the Gentiles. Right? The times of the Gentiles. And we are in the time, the dispensation that's known as the times of the Gentiles, the times of nation states. A, a good example of it is looking at the pre-Belgium conference maps of Africa. And then looking at the post, that means after the Belgium conference maps. And the key difference is that after the Belgium conference on the maps, Africa, what's called now Africa, is divided up into artificial borders, artificial boundaries, artificial nation states. And if you take those um, artificial boundaries and maps and you superimpose it over a modern map or today's, right today's map of Africa, you'll see that most of these artificial borders that have been drawn up by the so-called white Europeans. When did they do these things? They did these things at the Belgium conference. Before the Belgium conference, what did the map say? The content was called Ethiopia. After the Belgium conference, what do the, the maps begin to now update? They all become more uniform in saying what? They all become uniform in calling the continent Africa. And when we look at the maps post the Belgium conference, we see these artificial borders. So now this term Tobia and the term Ethiopia, after the Berlin, <laughs> after the Belgium conference, right? After the Belgium conference, it is called what? Right? What is what's identifiable? That that region the region that we see on the map generally speaking today the horn of africa but it's somehow shrunk and gotten a little smaller right because of the coastal territories taken by other white gentile nations you know what i mean um so that's the difference so the term ethiopia right um after 
um, I can say, um, after Belgium conference, I got to think about this every time I say it, brothers and sisters. After Belgium conference, right, it becomes this small landlocked country. Before the Belgium conference, it was identifiable, right, in the earliest, the earliest perspective with the great majority of the majority of the continent. It was like this right here, just to bring this up right here. It was like, it was like this right here, what we see right here, all right? And then down here, we have this little write-up right here, originally meant burnt face. So this is what the, the, the Greeks, right? And at this present time, we're talking about Greeks, so this region, we're talking about a region that like South, South, um, like South Africa, but a better example would be Australia. A better example even would be of America. You know how America belonged to the indigenous people who were, you know, um, um, black, reddish brown, so-called red. You know, you know, were different. Uh, almost 180 from the white Europeans that came from England and Western, you could say Western Europe or from Great Britannia, you know. So you see how that was taken over, you know, by another population, right. This is the same thing that happened with the ancient region that's called Greece. That was originally a non, we say, white people were there. The original people were, in modern terms, not white, just like the Romans took over or invaded, right? And, 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 and the, the Etruscans, the Etruscans, the Etruscans were the people. We can look at the artifacts and say, well, they were very much different, right, from the Latin people who came in. But anyway, the kingdom of Aksum here, according to what Mr. Imhotep has and other research right there, they say they appropriate the name in the 4th century B.C., right? In the 4th century B.C. Now, this is interesting. Here we have the 4th century B.C. That means like 400 years before the A.D., right? Now, they appropriated this particular name. Now, this is where we're going to get into a little bit more, but still, we, we're in the B.C. time. This is important to understand. Modern day Ethiopia was also known as Abyssinia, derived from the Arabic Habash, really Habasha, Habasha, Al Habasha, Habasha. They said of unknown origin. It's only of unknown origin if you do not know the linguistics. This is where language is the key, right? Language is the key. The gift of the Holy Spirit, right? Language is the key. Speaking in tongues, I mean real tongues, right? You know, is the key. It's not unknown the origin or the meaning of Al Habasha if you speak, if you speak Arabic, you understand it. If you speak um, you could say old archaic Amharic, well, if you speak Amharic and you go into the roots, right, of the Amharic and the roots of that linking with the Tigrinya, right? And even with Tigrinya it being a, and the Gutas, right, you have a lot of the roots that will connect, the connective roots linguistically speaking, right? Now, there's another derivation of Habasha, if we want to go Kabasha. Some derive the tricontinental roots, right? The, the H, the B, the SH, or the K, the B, the SH sound, and they go more into the um, like hieroglyphic, metuneta sort of perspective. But even that right there is actually derivable in its root origin from Ethiopia. So back to the title, back to the subject matter that ancient, ancient Egypt is from ancient Ethiopia and not the Africa, you know, not the Africa pseudonym, right? So now you see this right here. This is a very important map. I'm just going to be very brief. This is a very important map right here, right, to show the movement of our people. Right? When I say move our people, I'm not just saying just those who are like royal order of the Ethiopian Hebrews or the Israelites of Ethiopia or the Hebrew people, but of other African or other black, we could say, um, tribes. Remember, on the continent, it is said that there are about 3,000 tribes. And if there's 3,000 tribes on the continent, you mean we cannot find, <laughs> we cannot find any of the 12 tribes where we find the lion of Judah, the lion of the tribe, actually, the full name 
of Judah. Now here you can see at the bottom of this right up here, the modern country was named for this region when it became a British colony in the 1890s and from the 1880s to 1960. Look at that, see how recent we're talking? The areas located in West Africa were called Western Sudan. So a lot of our scholars that persist right in putting the Africa pseudonym forward, it'd be better, clearer argument universally speaking to say that the roots of ancient Egypt were black or to speak on the black roots of ancient Egypt right and then to refer right to the generality of the use of the term based on the evidence of the term black and to also identify that the term black yes is unincorporated the nationality tribe linguistics because then when we do that right there Right? We will have to go into all the details of the 3,000 tribes right? and the, the, the hundreds of languages. And see, that's where they throw this point at many of the scholars. Right? And this right here is also another um, uh, rhetorical kind of argument that they use against the, the black roots of ancient Egypt. And since most of the a lot of the black scholars are not really so linguistically adept. There are those amongst the black scholars who are linguistically adept, but they seem to be biased, or, or not biased, they are marginalized because of the bias by those scholars who are not linguistically adept. So they kind of are kept out the conversation or they're marginalized. The points they make are marginalized, but the points that they make, those linguistic scholars amongst us, the points that they make have never been taken to the table again say the modern day Egyptian Arab speaking ones or others that are making um, 180 opposite um, pseudo and false claims to say that the origin really is, is their history. So it's like the Arab people, the Arabic speaking peoples of like Egypt and so on are seeking to claim that ancient Egypt has nothing to do with like it was like an Arab kind of I don't know paradise or something like that modern Arab because the modern Arabs, I'm talking about like the white Arabs. So we also have to identify things like that because there are black Arabs and amongst a lot of the pro-black, pro-Africa has dismissed the fact that some of the people who are technically speaking Africans, if, if, if that's what the, the new name of the continent is being forced, you know, but they, they have their own roots. So they're black people with all the phenotype and the features and everything else, but they just happen to identify Right, their mother tongue, right, with you could say with 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 the Arab Arabic, you know, speakers, but they are the origin of that. Just as we say that black people that were in Europe and bring forth some evidence to back that up, right, were black people, melanated people. The same thing we can say about the so-called Arab and Ishmaelic culture, right. So this whole racism and white supremacy, we seek to demonstrate. Right, is more subtle in other areas unless we develop and deploy the proper uh, linguistic arguments, right, and also hold to it, right, from scholarship to scholarship, you know, or at least identify that it's a relative point. Even if you want to use the term Africa, 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 Africa to, to speak with the whole continent, because your audience, you might not have prepared your audience, you know, for the upgrade. Right? So we're saying that an upgrade is necessary within the so-called black consciousness, pro-comedic community, right? when we are looking at the origins and then when we are on the, on the front lines or in this battle right? against those who are saying you know, the opposite and those who are basically trying to misappropriate right? our collective you know, ancient culture. Right? Because Africa right, as a name only really truly historically refers to this portion that's in that same northern northern Africa region that has also been historically colonized right, by Arabic speaking peoples right Arabic speaking and, and, and may, I, may I say at least in the present day terminology um, white Ar Ar Arabic speaking peoples Right? So even though a lot of the, 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 the white Arabs or the Islamic or the, the other Arabs in different countries might have their issues, arguments, and fight against 
England, America, Europe, the Western culture, we might think that we are all in bed together. But it seems as though, you know, um, some of us, if we are in that bed, we're at the foot of the bed. You know what I'm saying? While others, you know, they're in the comfy position. They got a pillow and, and they got cover. You know, we're, we're shivering at the foot of that bed. Right. And we say that, that we need to just like, you know, like just take the mattresses off the table. I mean, off the bed, you know, take the mattresses off the bed, shake everything out, beat, you know, beat the pillows, get all the, 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 the bed bugs out. All, all of that. We, that's what we need to do. You know, right there. You know. Yes. Yeah, so here we're going to sum it up right here. According to some scholars, it's the Latin name of the Roman province in modern day Tunisia, Algeria, Libya. Well, according to some scholars, but according to the evidence. The original origin of the name is uncertain. See, whenever we start to say that there, this is spooky. This is spookism. How can the origin of the name be uncertain? Well, it's because there must be some suppression, right? They said the cover up is worse than the lie. Meaning like dusty or sunny and have been proposed. Many of the European map makers use this name for the entire continent. Now this is now they said medieval European map makers. Now it all depends on what time period he's speaking about medieval, but we understand the relative truth of that. And then here right here is the Guinea, the Guinea, right? Guinea, Guinea region, and then also how the Libya region, right? You know, what was called the Libya region. Over what's happening right here. So look at the Libya region. The Libya region is also where a lot of the Arabic claims come from, right? Or, 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 or not, not come from, but are supported by. They can use this as a backative, as a backing for that. You can see right here how right here, look what's happening. We have we have um, the east and the west of Egypt. Like when we, when we go into here, look at look at that right there. The east and the west. So we have east of the River Nile is the part that's in the kind of mustard, like orange, and the, 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 the brownish color right there, that is the west. Now, if you know anything about ancient Egypt or Kemet, you understand the significance. You should be able to understand the significance of that, right? You know, but notice what they're doing by making this particular claim right here, right? When I say this claim, this claim has already been made. Right, like it says in the classical Greek, Libya was referred to as the lands between the Nile and the Atlantic Ocean. Well, actually, in classical Greek times, there was no such thing as the Atlantic Ocean. We know that from the map. That was the Ethiopian Ocean. See how they do this. So, if we're not able to untangle this easily and simply, we can, we have. But that has not been accepted by some of your leading scholars and scholarship, and they have to be, um, I guess, they made aware of this. They are aware of this, right? But they, it, this really has to be settled because when we see them losing the way they had lost and then trying to regather and, you know, it's like they're punch drunk, you know, on a certain level because they don't want to identify, like, where the pre these are the pressure points. These are the pressure points that keep getting hit and will get hit, right? And basically knock them out, right? Or put them in so much like paralyzing pain that they'll come back to us and say, no, they're racist. Look what they're doing, they're racist. And hype us up, you know, and send up our blood pressure, so to speak. You know, we black peoples, you know, and we're back to square one. It's like we're going around the same old mountain or rather they're going around the same old mountain. It's time to move forward. So name possibly derived from the ancient Libu tribe was reintroduced. Look at that. In 1934, look how recent we are speaking, brothers and sisters. See, some think that this whole thing, oh, this whole Africa thing goes back 400 years. It doesn't. It doesn't. Right? Now, we as black people, we have been adversely affected. Right? Whatever the nomenclatures or naming or identification, right, for this period of time of 400, more than, but specifically speaking of the 400 year period of time, it identifies certain specific things that was done against our collective interests. Right? It doesn't mean that before 400 years everything was peachy and, and there was no problem, but it means that within that particular 400 year period of time, so we're looking at dispensations of time, this is important because otherwise the argument goes all over the place. We're talking about something that we, we call it today, right? But then we try to superimpose this, right, on thousands of years in the past, it's, it's anachronistic anachronistic is like out of his proper um, chronology out of his proper time 
and you can only fool like the the ignorant you know okay this is an interesting um, meme right there you can only fool the ignorant you know what I mean in other words a lot of our scholars will talk to us to our people and and speak this rhetoric right you know speak these things hype us up might hype us up and um, there's one other area yeah hype us up we get all hyped up and we think we're making progress but then every time we get a major shot across the bow like what happened with them shutting down the um the the I'll call it pro black right pro black ancient Kemetic conference now this archaeology here they call this the Hicksile some call this the Hicksiles um Hicksos you know um the Beni Hassan now what's so interesting is the possible and the likely Cushitic connections Cushitic connections or even likely Cushitic connections right um this art in fact right here like some of y'all might have seen this let's see if we can get a bigger picture of this okay some of this right here it's been like um presented in different depends you could find different uh, pr presentations cut chopped up this is just zooming in on this tomb right the beni hassan what's called the beni hassan right and this is by us from a royal order of the ethiopian hebrews you know what i mean um commandment keepers and this perspective right because it's prior to the i u i i s u p k i c u p k all of that which came later on this is like into our roots we will identify this as the the hebrews right or the we say the the hebrews the root of the israelites coming in right to ancient you know to ancient egypt to ancient mitzrayim others might identify this as some nebulous group of like hicksiles right they say the hicksiles and then the hicksiles is a terminology that rightly in ancient kemet ancient egypt would generally refer to immigrant it's like today we have this immigrant argument going on right here and even how black people right who were brought over here right by force are being re-identified as immigrants. You know how the, the whole slavery narrative is being rewritten to say that, well, slavery wasn't like many of us, you know, a little older who were taught these things, you know, credible and, and referential evidence was used to persuade us and convince us. But they say, no, 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 it wasn't that. It was like immigration, it was like immigrants. Immigrants were just coming to better their life and, and make a, you know, a better life for themselves. And, you know, and that's why black people were brought over here because they were trying to better their life. They was working for food. I've heard some pastors and preachers and black folks talk about this recently, and I had to take a double take because they were really seriously saying that that's what it was. It's, it's almost like, um, cognitive dissonance you know cognitive dissonance but it's being accepted right so anyway this right here in re-looking at it there are some scholars that present that actually this can be identified with the hyksos right likely the hebrews right we say likely the hebrews but some of the, so we're taking what they say what we say and trying to find kind of a middle ground that some identify this as the Hyksos, right? Generally speaking, immigrants or, or shepherd kings, you know, then we get into the linguistics there. Others identify this more directly as the Hebrews, right? And we say that we're some who identify this also in that way. But then this can also be looked at from the scholastic study as being a Kushite, <laughs> an Ethiopian, a Kushite. And this is what's particularly interesting in light of a true reading might of the Hebrew Bible and I emphasize the Hebrew the King James Bible well on some levels the King James Bible falls short I have to admit when you get to a certain level of scholarship you know the King if you if you're stuck on the King James Bible only because you're relying on somebody else it's like it's like I give you the food right and you eat the food and you tell me how the food tastes right you tell me how the food tastes and then I'm acting like I actually tasted the food Right? But all I am doing is regurgitating your description. I haven't gotten a taste of it for myself. So those who understand the linguistics right, can get a taste of it. And hail up to the Zion, Zion Lex. Yes, Abdiel um, Lewi or Levi. But I'll say Abdiel Lewi. Yeah, because um, just even how he, a fellow um, Hebrew and Israelite brother, right, coming from that same root, you know, of the Royal Order of the Ethiopian Hebrews, Commandment Keepers Congregation, how he has come to the point to, to master 
significantly. You know, the Metu um, Neter, right, or the, um, there's some other names for the names, like the Ra'an, Ren, you know, but the ancient Egyptian, you could say hieroglyphs, the ancient Egyptian, you know, linguistic and also culture as well. He applied himself to this. And that's a great, um, that is important because there are some of our black scholars, uh, pro-Egyptian comedic scholars, that admittedly, right, are going about championing and seeking to go on the front lines and they have not got this training. They have not upped their skills. And this is, this is, it, it, it's not so much even just to say like just dangerous. It is dangerous, right, in, in, in the scholastic battle. It is dangerous in the scholastic battle. Right? Now, you have to recognize that a lot of this is also redrawn by different ones. You know, it's interesting how it's redrawn. And then from the stereotypical, like the stereotype of um, white supremacy and white racism, ones will say, well, well, they're dark, but they're not really us because you're looking at the stereotype. Right? There's a stereotype of us. Now, this is also important right here when we're looking at scholarship. My, we're looking at scholarship. Some might dismiss this, but this is also a part of what goes on, you know, because maybe others, you know, they've been arguing that this is not what it is, and we didn't know that, well, you know, this actually matches what the scriptures say, all right? This also verifies it. So we have a twofold, like a two points connection, some of the repainting of this. We have a twofold, a two point connection. We have a Hebrew link to this, not to get into some of the deeper, you know, other areas, you know. We have uh, the Ethiopian perspective, right? We have the Ethiopian perspective. Let me just, uh, uh, just to sum up where we started out right here. We have the Ethiopian perspective, right? The, the inner Africa, there we go right there. The inner Africa, right? There we go. The inner Africa perspective. Right, the in the Ethiopia perspective, I think we agreed on that. Some now there's another level of 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 disagreement among some of our main and even top black scholars whether the origin of the ancient Egyptian culture came from what they call West Africa, what we know as West. Ethiopia or from lower Ethiopia or from upper Ethiopia. We say, along with Legasa Alent and also other scholars, we say that it came from upper Ethiopia, that's to say what they call in Africa. There's other scholars like I think Jabari, I think even ones like Osari Imhotep, and there's many others that say that ancient Egypt, right, origins can be found, right? We can find peoples, right? But they actually kind of make an origins argument now. It's like there's an origin argument. See, if we find people, some of these people could have migrated from ancient Egypt territory, right, in the east and migrated to the west. But what some are saying that, yes, they migrated to the west and these ones that are in the west are actually, you know, the, the, the progenitors of that culture there. Now, I'm not saying that black peoples in, wet, in the west of the continent had no role in that ancient Egyptian Kemetic um, um, scene. No, they did. But if we're talking about the origin of the primary culture, the root culture of ancient Egypt, ancient Mitzrayim, ancient Kemet, it is from Upper Ethiopia. Right? It's from Upper Ethiopia. Okay, now the ones who, who, who may have not checked out any video, maybe, you know, ones will be checking this out. Um, I do have a map to show you that. Um, I brought it up before. I would like to actually show you that so that when we look at things like this right here, right? And you say, oh, this is South Africa. Well, yeah, we call it today South Africa, right? But it's, it's, it's the southern part of the Tobia. It's the southern part of the good land, Tob, right? Remember that the Hebrew connection with ancient Egypt is historically valid. It's just so, people might not like it, people who are against the Hebrews or against the Western whitewashed Christians or, or others, you know, they might be against it for religious reasons, historical reasons, because a lot of these religions or Bible has been used, you know, the Bible's like fire, 
You can use fire to warm a baby's bottle or to keep yourself, uh, you know, warm or cook food, or, or you can use fire to torture somebody. So the Bible has been used by the, you know, the Anglo-Europeans, Anglo-Americans, you know, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Christians and others, you know, to basically torture, right, black people, right, by and large, right? But just these sort of connections, right, like even the fly wisp right here. This is a, just an interesting kind of connection right here, right? So it doesn't change the evidence, right? It doesn't primarily change the evidence. So some put this forward right here, right? And a lot of this is also very, very valid, right? Very, very valid. So just to share that right here, I think this is, it might be a, might be an Orthodox priest or whatnot, but this is also used in Ethiopia, right? The fly wisp, right? So we see all of these cultures. Okay, that's another thing right there, right? We see, oh, let's actually put that right there because it's, it's, it's kind of interesting when you look at it, when you, if, if you can see it from that point of view, right? But yeah, um, so brothers and sisters, let's sum this up right here. Give thanks for, for viewing this right here. Please like, share, and subscribe. Oh, boom, we got it. This is the point right here. Okay, th no, that's, this is, this is the one, one of the maps, I think 17, 1600, or 17, 16th century. Ethiopia, inferior, Negro land. You see that? One time it was just Ethiopia, upper Ethiopia. You see what said Ethiopia superior, right? Ethiopia superior. Now, of course, one can argue that, but understand it in, terms of superior inferior can have it's this is the better black people this is the worst black people but it also is referring to the territory the land the geography i just point that out this is not trying to defend you know but i'm trying to understand like we talk about the ethiopian ocean okay i thought that was the map right there brothers and sisters there was a particular map you see right here where it says that ethiopia country is wholly unknown to the europeans completely unknown it seems as though when they got to quote know it you remember you, you remember in the bible what knowing is like adam knew his wife there's another way we can say that you know what i mean it's like when he got to know it huh, look what has happened to the, the 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 knowledge of it like when he got to know it he wanted to make sure that we would not know what he got to know when he finally got to know it we're trying to find that map that it has upper ethiopia and and lower ethiopia on it okay it's there we have it it's just that we wasn't prepared to show that right here it wasn't the epicenter of our reasoning and yes some brothers and sisters you know you know they like the videos and everything but they be a little bit long you know and yeah we are a little bit long-winded here but it's just necessary because then after we get out the basic points then others can go over these same points and you know kind of we can have like you know what you say highlights you know highlights from some of the reason you know it's like the word says that which we hear you know we speak you know so it's following the the Ruach Adosh, you know, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth on this right here. So yes, brothers and sisters, Ethiopia, and we didn't even go deeply in the Ethiopian Ocean, <laughs> the Ethiopian Sea, you know what I mean? All this is important, right, for, for origin sakes, right, you know? So we need to reunite as so-called black people, right, around the true knowledge right of being ethiopian people if we say we're african peoples we really need to identify ourselves truly from an ancient perspective as those ethiopian peoples and more evidence we'll bring forward to substantiate that yes brothers and sisters give thanks once again like share subscribe um check us out lojs.org any contacts give thanks brothers and sisters any contacts for communications we advise ones directed to lojs.org that's lojs.org hit contact um and um also check out the podcast as well the regular sabbatical studies the daily psalms also more in our yeshiva we call that our rastafari yeshiva in that sense you know just going according to our roots you know of the tribe our tribe well it's the tribe of judah tribe of yehuda but repping you know repping the israelites you know the biblical legitimate 
we, the black Jews of the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So shalom chabarim, shalom and thank you all others. Give thanks for the donations, you know, for the support, for the goodwill and the good word and also sharing, you know, the information or even just a part of the information that one's like. You know, because there's some areas that, that some ones and ones have said, I like when you go into this and I've, I've learned a lot from you. I might not agree with you over here, but over here. So I give thanks for that as well. You know, one hand washes the other and both hand washes the face. So be clean, Chabarim. Yes, I. Shalom. Yeshua Shalom. Yes, I.